Okay, it says it's recording. Okay. All right, so this is Peter O'Rourke with NAPSIG Foundation. Um, I am uh, joined by Bill Burgess of NISGIC, the National States Geographic Information Council. Um, Bill is a Washington representative, and today's virtual training session is on the um, NISGIC's GIS inventory. Um, that GIS inventory is, uh, oh, and I'm back connected. The GIS inventory is um, uh, created by NISGIC through a partnership with DHS. Bill can get into those details a bit more. Um, NAPSIG has partnered with NISGIC on a whole bunch of efforts, um, including the ability to host these virtual training sessions. Um, so um, NAPSIG Foundation really values the partnership with NISGIC. We think they're a great organization, um, and we uh, enjoy the collaboration. Um, so as per usual, um, everybody is on mute. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, um, please use the chat section, section or the Q&A um, function on your WebEx. We will monitor those, and if the time is right for um, interrupt bill, we will, and if it's better to hold off just a little bit, we'll hold off a little bit. Um, and with that being said, Bill, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, so I'm not necessarily going to be monitoring the uh, chat and all that. If you can help me out with that, Peter, I'll try and open it up in a you know a few minutes as I Absolute, get going. But absolutely, no, I'll do that for you on your behalf. Bill. Okay, all right. Well, appreciate the opportunity today to show you all the brand new version of the GIS inventory that we just uh, went live with on Monday night, and this is version six. It's been uh, the system's been in existence since about 2005 uh, when we first developed it under a NOAA contract. And since that point in time, the Department of Homeland Security has funded our operations because they have an interest in being able to see uh, the data sets that people produce around the country. And that's why we're talking to this community today. And I noticed on the chat panel, I see a lot of familiar names uh, of people that we work with on a routine basis. So. Uh, I'm Bill Burgess, uh, and as Peter said, I'm the Washington Liaison for the National States Geographic Information Council. Uh, previously was a State of Maryland employee, spent 11 years in emergency services. And um, uh, Boyce Tomlin is our system developer. He should be on the uh, WebEx today, uh, but he's uh, just here basically to observe and hopefully get me out of trouble if I get in any. Uh, and one thing that... Um, I want to let you all know is that uh, this is a brand new WebEx system. They never notified us they were doing it, and it's uh, a little bit different, so we may stumble here and there because of the WebEx, but hopefully things will go smoothly. So I want to give you just a couple of seconds about what NISGIC is, because I know some of you aren't familiar with our organization. We're a national nonprofit. I've got the URL up there on screen. Uh, what we're all about is uh, government efficiency and effectiveness through the use of geospatial technologies. Our principal members are the state geographic information officers that typically work for the CIO. Sometimes they are direct reports to the governor uh, or the statewide GIS coordinators where we don't have an official geographic information officer position. We have membership you know, throughout all the rest of the suckers, uh, academic, federal, local, uh, and other types of organizations. Uh, but the ones that we really work for, per se, are those state GIOs and GIS coordinators. Uh, a couple of our initiatives, to give you a little bit of an idea of what our organization is all about, uh, is National Address Point Database is one of the things we're pushing very hard to have happen, uh, working with some of the federal agencies to try and make that a reality. A National Road Centerline Database. Uh, we worked with the Department of Transportation, and with some new legislation, they were able to create the Arnold uh, system, and they're bringing in the road networks from local government through the state agencies, the DOTs, and they're going to be assembling the National Road Centerline Database. Uh, we're also uh, working with uh, another agency to see the uh, development of a National Elevation Database. And a lot of this, uh, our focus lately is because the next generation 911 and the implementation of it and the fact that it's going to be moving into the GIS environment. So having good access to national data sets that are consistent across the country is going to be a great help to next gen 911. 
We're also uh, involved in advocacy work uh, beyond what we do directly with the agencies. We do a little bit with Congress. The two initiatives we're working with right now are Digital Coast Act to try and get uh, the NOAA Coastal Services Center authorized uh, as a program for Digital Coast, and then also some new legislation uh, that's going to be introduced here in a couple of weeks on the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Uh, what we're really here today to talk about is metadata. And unfortunately, the majority of GIS users in this country still do not create and distribute metadata, uh, which is data about their data, uh, to other organizations. Um, and it's important uh, for people to know what other people are producing. You know, most of us are funded through tax dollars, and we pay those tax dollars. And we like to see people avoid duplication uh, in the creation of these data sets. So by registering what you create uh, in a system like the GIS inventory, you can help uh, reduce that duplication of effort. The content standard for digital geospatial metadata, that's what CSDGM is, uh, that standard has been in place for 20 years now, and uh, we adhere to it. It's the way that we can communicate with a variety of other systems. Uh, and you can see just a small excerpt of a metadata record from uh, Richard Bucker right down in Florida uh, at the bottom of the screen there. But the bottom line is creating metadata really is a basic professional competency uh, that shouldn't be ignored in this day and age. So how does the GIS inventory help you uh, with this? If you haven't had any training or don't have the tools to create metadata, it provides a simple interface for manual entry that will allow you to be compliant with the federal CSCGM standard. Uh, we also have a new harvest function uh, that will allow you to automatically export the contents of your ARC catalog or if you have a web accessible folder uh, with metadata records in it, um, you can harvest over to our site and ingest the information automatically and we'll show you how that works today. A um, couple of thoughts about GIS inventory. It really is pretty painless. Uh, the average user that maybe has you know, 30 or 40 data layers uh, can create an account in 25 minutes and with manual entry at about one to two minutes per data layer, uh, maybe an hour and a half investment of time, and then you're up and running. And then you know, once a month, come back and visit, uh, make sure your information's up to date, that type of thing. Um, the system will connect you to uh, your community uh, and hopefully we want you to be leaders in your community and encourage the surrounding jurisdictions to participate in the GIS inventory because you want that information that they create available to you uh, for emergencies or your routine operations. Uh, the system also connects you nationally uh, because you're going to be able to locate others across the country in your community of practice. Uh, and. Uh, maintaining an up-to-date profile in the system and knowing which data sets you are planning to produce, uh, state and federal agencies can locate you in the system uh, to see about developing partnerships for those data sets. And there's no cost to the user community. As I said up front, the Department of Homeland Security underwrites all the costs for the development and maintenance of the GIS inventory. Uh, so uh, there's really very little reason why people shouldn't uh, you know, put their information into the system. Uh, two uh, examples of why it's important in particular to the emergency management community, uh, mutual aid situation at the local level. Uh, this is Missouri, and if we were going from Jefferson City uh, over to Kansas City to help out, uh, more than likely uh, your technical people are going to still support uh, your firefighters or emergency managers that are going over there. They need to be able to get access to the data that's over in Kansas City, and with a system like this, you can do it. Uh, and a little tougher situation would be if Florida were to send firefighters out to those uh, wildland fires out in Oregon and Washington. A uh, much greater distance, a less likelihood that they would have a working relationship than maybe within the state of Missouri. And it's important to be able to, again, find those data sets to support their own people until they get out there and become part of that emergency operations center and get support directly on site and that type of thing. So I'm going to stop with the slides now, and we're going to switch over to the system. And uh, basically, this is what the uh, front end looks like. Uh, it's not a vacation Bill? travel. Yes. 
Uh, sorry, it's Peter. There's a question I can answer, but I, for the benefit of everyone, um, like offer up for you to answer it. Um, okay. Is this tied to the tied to the Virtue USA system um, or program? Sorry, it's not tied at this time to Virtual USA. And I see we got Paul Rosner on the line today too. Uh, but we do make the data available in the system out to the uh, data.gov site and that is harvested by the geospatial platform and the Department of Homeland Security is uh, connecting already or will be soon uh, out to the geospatial platform to pull information in. So by adhering to the CSDGM standard, we're able to move in and out of a variety of platforms. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, it does, yeah, thanks, Bill. Okay. All right, so the um, site itself, uh, this is what it looks like. There are a variety of photographs. Every time you log in, you're going to see a different photograph. So uh, it's not a vacation planning tool. Uh, these images come up from our NISJIC website. Uh, we put uh, a variety of images in the front end of the system, uh, one for each of the states, uh, so that uh, we're representative of all the states as we go across the country, and just the same images pop up in here. And there are three basic ways uh, to enter into the system. There's a top navigation, uh, along with a more button over here to get additional information. And then if you scroll down the page, there are some icons down here that will allow you to create an account, search for data, view the status map, and search a directory, which are basically the same tools you have up here. And there's also the same types of links down in the footer, along with some contact information uh, and all that. And we've found through the years people like to do things differently. So uh, we provide these three entry points. But for today, I'm going to be working on the um, uh, tab, uh, top navigation up here. Uh, first off, in the system, just so you know, there is a bunch of information uh, on the About page that will explain the system, why you should participate, the upgrades in the current version, and we also have our acceptable use policy, privacy statements, and liability statements in here. Um, more importantly for most people, because I doubt that too many are going to want to read that information, uh, we have the Getting Started Guides, and this is just straight text at this point. Uh, before the end of the year, we will have uh, YouTube videos that will accompany each of these uh, getting started guides. Uh, but it talks about things like creating your user account and walks you through enough detail that, um, you know, if you have any problems, you should be able to clearly understand it through these different guides. Uh, what we found so far is with this interface, the people that have been testing it for us or having absolutely no problems with it. It's very intuitive. Uh, another thing that we've put in the More button is a public safety page. Uh, up until this release of the GIS inventory, we had two different systems that were virtually identical, but they had different front end pages or home pages. One of them was uh, geared towards the public safety community. Uh, but since the systems were really identical, uh, we were maintaining two systems, and it was becoming a bit of a problem. We decided to consolidate under the one interface. But we did throw up some additional information for the public safety community. Uh, Geocon Ops, uh, you've got the link uh, to get out to it here. Uh, U.S. National Grid, we know is important uh, to the emergency management community. The NAPSIG uh, Capability and Readiness Assessment Tool, if you haven't seen, is a good tool uh, designed for you all. Uh, just the NAPSIG website, the National Information Sharing Consortium, uh, our organization, NISJIC, and the uh, Land uh, Infrastructure Foundation Level Database, High Field, they create national data sets uh, for the emergency management community. We also have the geospatial platform and Digital Coast, which have quite a few uh, tools and data available uh, that will work uh, quite well for emergency managers. So these resources are identified here, and we will just keep building this page uh, with additional tools, um, you know, or links to them uh, that people tell us they want. Uh, we also have a support uh, ticket on this. If you need help uh, while you're in the system, 
uh, or something doesn't seem to be working right for you, you can open a support request, complete your name, email. Uh, hopefully you'll give us your phone number. A lot of times I like to just call people back instead of trading emails. Uh, and put your question or comments uh, in this block. The first time you come in, you have to add the uh, CAPTCHA that we have here under the security code box and then submit your request. And it goes out to the system administrator and to myself. Uh, we both man the uh, help desk. We guarantee uh, a reasonable period of response um, on the Eastern time zone during normal work hours. But the fact is both of us typically monitor our emails uh, pretty much 24 seven and uh, we'll typically get back to people over the weekends or in the evenings also, uh, but we're not guaranteeing that. So going back to the top navigation, uh, one of the first functions in the system is a data layer search. And uh, when people are looking for particular data sets, uh, and we're going to go in and put some keywords in, uh, we've got a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, you can put one or more terms in here uh, to look for a particular data set. With this box checked, which is the default, uh, if you use two words, both of those words must appear in the metadata or you know the database record. Uh, you can check this box, which would be either or in the, uh, those terms. Uh, and then we also have a wildcard search, so we'll just do uh, one right now. Uh, and we'll say crop information, and I've run most of these things before. So in this case, uh, we have 32 results uh, nationally right now that are showing up uh, with the word crop uh, in the uh, records. So if I want to narrow this down, you can uh, hopefully see we've got some in Florida, some in New Jersey, Indiana. Um, I'm not even sure where some of these other ones are, but uh, going in, if I just add Kansas in this case and then execute the search, I bring it down to 11, uh, 11 records. And then there's a county in Kansas called Franklin. And if I execute that search, I'm going to get one record. Uh, so by using the AND operators uh, in the search box, you can really narrow down your search uh, by geography, by organization, by an individual name if you want to. Uh, I'm sure some of you know Richard Butkerite in uh, Florida. If I put his name in, I'm going to get the records in the system that have some association with him. Uh, so again, you can do an individual. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to worry about explaining the uh, OR terms right now. Uh, wildcard. Uh, Let's say if I just do a BU, no records are found. Uh, but if I do uh, something like this with a wild card, then I'm going to go back and I'm going to find uh, these records uh, where Richard's name is in them. Uh, so again, maybe you don't know how to spell a particular term. Uh, you can use a wild card to be able to help you with that kind of a search. So it's a very straightforward search routine. Uh, there is an advanced search routine in the system. It uh, allows you to do the same keywords, but you can also uh, drop down. We have 435 uh, right currently uh, data layer names in our system, and it's one of the things that makes us different from most of the metadata systems is we like to uh, catalog everything according to our naming convention because it will make your job in an emergency much easier when it comes to finding that information. So there is a, a metadata system uh, that's referred to as ISO, the International Standards Organization, and they have 19 basic categories ranging from biota uh, to utilities and communication. And if we pick uh, one of these, and um, yeah, I'm just going to do biota for right now, uh, then there will be a set of layer names that will pop up. So I can pick the first one, Amphibian Distribution and Habitat. So if you're not familiar with our names, uh, you can go in and just drop down these searches. You can also look for things that are only published to the web, uh, that only have a map service associated with them, uh, or progress codes, publication date ranges. Uh, you can do geography filters if you want. 
uh, and then execute the search. Uh, so in this case, I did amphibian distribution and habitat, and in the system there are eight results nationally uh, for that. And when we get into one of these searches, we can, uh, that's a test record, so I'm not going to go into there. Uh, I'm going to go down to this one. This uh, link will bring you out to a form that will provide most of the information that you're going to be interested in. Uh, we can go back and uh, view the metadata record, uh, which is in the XML format. Uh, so this is the raw information uh, that is being provided. Uh, we can go to the organization's website from this link. Uh, in this case, it was Towson University. Uh, that provided it. We can also click on the individual's name and open up an email and send them a message if we want to uh, to find out more information. But we can read uh, the abstract on the data set, uh, place key information, um, access constraints, distribution, liability, and we can see what the bounding coordinates uh, on a map are for this particular data set, uh, so where the availability is. Uh, and then I can just return to the search, uh, and I could modify the search if I wanted to and keep going. Uh, again, you can narrow down by selecting the geography you want in terms of states. You can go in. I have to select the state here first. So if I do Maryland and then go and look for the counties, the counties that are in Maryland will show up. I can actually click on those. And then the same thing with the city list. And this information comes from the U.S. Census Bureau from the minor civil divisions file that we use in our system. Uh, we also have um, locations for tribal areas, but in Maryland there are tribal uh, lands. And then we have coastal waters identified. And um, we can uh, let you search or inventory your data on those. So that's basically the data layer search function. In the status map function, which is going to be the next tab over, there are three things that you can do uh, with this uh, window. You can look at the status of a particular data layer, and here, uh, right in the very first ISO category and the first data layer, which is, again is amphibian distribution and habitat, you can see uh, where these have been uh, logged around the country. So we're showing uh, information in Maryland, Missouri, and um, Georgia uh, for this uh, on the uh, different projects. We give you a head count over here for how many data layers there are. Uh, and you can do a quick look uh, on these things with just a click. Uh, we Just so you know, we have Wikipedia links for all the jurisdictions that will show up here if you want to learn a little more about that jurisdiction. Uh, but we also let you view the data and contacts from here. And this is just a form to, you know, see some basic information about it and who the contact would be for this particular data layer. Uh, we can close that out. Um, so that's the status map. Something that might uh, ring a little more uh, true for you would be something like ortho imagery. So I'm going to select that, and you can see there's a lot more activity here. We actually have 1,563 records in the system. Uh, the color codes are down here in the lower left-hand corner. If it's blue, it's a planned uh, project. If it's orange, it's in work. And if it's green, it's complete. Uh, and to the extent that the users maintain and update their information, this is correct. Uh, so again, you can pull a status in and see what the development of particular data layers, like in Kansas, we can see the level of development of ortho imagery uh, there. Uh, another search routine is virtually identical to the data layer search. And again, if I just do crop and execute that search, um, let me zoom in a little bit here. Uh, we can see that uh, there are various boxes. And again, according to the color codes down here that show up. And I can go in and click on a box to bring up uh, the layer name uh, that we've appended. Uh, also, the basic information about uh, whose uh, data it is. I can view the layer result uh, in a drop-down or a slider box here that has quite a bit of detail. 
on the data set. Uh, the other thing I can do is um, as you select something here, um, it will uh, should come back and highlight. Okay, but it's not doing it, and I suspect that's because of the WebEx. Uh, it works otherwise. Uh, it would highlight which of these layers uh, was being displayed over here. Uh, but I can go over and basically select here. Uh, the system will recenter and show you where that extent is for that particular data layer. And then I can hit an information button here that will bring up that same information for me. Uh, and we can look at the imported records and that type of thing that are in the system. So um, pretty straightforward. And again, it's just uh, an extension of the data layer search that you know brings the map into play here and shows you where these data sets are uh, while you're looking for them. Another thing that's here on the status map function is the cadastral map. And we are uh, basically just got an update on this. This is not something that's user maintained within the system uh, at this point. It is a data set that comes to us from the Federal Geographic Data Committee cadastral subcommittee, and they have inventoried uh, data download links for parcel data uh, around the country, uh, so viewing links and download links. And what we did is we just took their data set and did a quality control check on it. Uh, it was 2013 data, I believe, February of 2013. So we did a quality control check to make sure that the URLs that were being provided were live uh, links and where they weren't, uh, we went ahead and deleted those records, and we're going to work with them to bring that information up to date. Also, we're going to be working with the states uh, to bring that information up to date. But here, uh, if we go into particular location, I'm just going to go to Montana in one of the counties there, and if I click, the system will give me uh, the data viewing URL and the data download URL. So the viewing will take me over to a Montana cadastral site that will allow me to uh, view the cadastral data. And I believe in this case that it's, yeah, it's actually the same system. Uh, so I can both view and download in Montana at the same site. And some cases these are going to be, you know, individual county maintained sites. In some cases the states and the counties are working very effectively together uh, and bringing all the information into one site. So that is a capability that's here. Uh, the real business driver for this uh, for the cadastral subcommittee is wildland fires. Uh, being able to access parcel data quickly in a, a large wildland fire situation to know where they've got properties that are improved and that type of thing that they can get in and uh, get people out. So that's the uh, purpose of that. So we've reviewed the three tabs here on the status map. Um, the system has the Mo My Profile. Uh, normally you'd have to log in, but I'm already logged into the system. Uh, so I'm going to go into just the basic profile. This is the information that you complete uh, when you first create an account, and it's all very important information. Uh, it's your contact information. It's you know information about you, per se. Um, we ask if we can uh, include you in the directory on the system uh, that we can send you emails regarding the system and we're going to make an email push probably tomorrow to let all of the existing users know about the new system. Uh, you can register in one or multiple states. Uh, the reason that we do this is because many of the states manage their user community uh, with an administrator in the state and so this way you will show up in their account. Um, and that's the only reason. Uh, it's not that you would be limited in any way to access information in the system uh, by the way you register in here. So you fill in that information. We have some information about your organizational profile. Uh, in essence, you know, one of the most important is what type of business are you in? And this will help you in the directory try and figure out uh, where other people are located that are in your same business. Uh, systems profile is mostly related to the uh, web mapping services that you have and then also the datums projections uh, and units of measure that you use in the distribution of your systems uh, or your data. 
Uh, your policies profile uh, is important for the state coordination efforts. Uh, it provides information on, you know, do you distribute data? Do you have a written policy? How do we get a hold of that policy? Do you make your data available for download? Do you normally copyright or license? How do we get your license agreement? Do you charge for data? So all those types of questions are there, and it's very helpful if you'll complete that. Uh, the geography section is important. Uh, I'm going to go in and create a second geography for myself. Uh, I can view, uh, in this case, my default geography, and what I've got set up is for the state of Maryland and only the counties on the eastern shore of Maryland where I live uh, currently. Uh, so if I want to add a geography to this, I can go in and I'm just going to put NAPSIG is the name of this geography. And uh, it's not nationwide. You need to make sure that's checked unless you are nationwide. And then do I want it to be my default geography? And I'm not going to check that. Uh, but I'm going to put it in Maryland. And uh, it's uh, ask you if it's statewide for that state. If it is, you check yes. Uh, I'm going to save it. And then it will allow me at that point to come back and add counties uh, in particular if I want to. So I'm going to say Anne Arundel County where I used to live. And uh, I'm going to update the geography. I can come back and I can add particular cities if I want to. Uh, so, you know, something like the Annapolis area, uh, again, which is Anne Arundel County in Maryland, I can update that. And if there were tribal areas in Maryland, I could select one of the tribal lands and then also the coastal waters. So I'm going to save that geography. So um, if I go back into uh, my geographies now, you can see I've got the NAPSIG geography, and it's saved as Maryland and Rundle County and Annapolis, Maryland uh, as uh, geography. Uh, another area in the system in your account, this is where you would actually inventory your data sets if you're going to do it manually. And we'll show you a different way to do it here in a minute. Uh, but you select the data layer category uh, that you want to inventory in. So you might select elevation, and you might have noticed that these data layer names changed. Uh, so if I want to do a digital elevation model, I can just click on that, and it will open a form tool. There are a couple of questions you have to answer. Uh, progress code uh, has to be answered. Uh, it's required uh, as part of the federal metadata standard, so I'll say it's a complete data set. The source is from um, uh, LIDAR, and the approximate scale is 1 to 2400. Update frequency, uh, you know, I'm going to put not provided. Um, content, let's say it's 2014, and then the publication date, which is the year we distribute, is going to be 2014. Um, we encourage people to put a good description in that box. And then there's some other information that you can answer down here, uh, but it's not critical. So it's just that fast, really, to do the basic level of what's required. Um, we do have information about archive. If you do uh, archive the information, uh, if you say yes, it will open up a couple of other questions to answer. I'm not going to explain all of those. They're pretty uh, self-explanatory. We also ask about, are you using federal grant money? If you say yes, there are several questions. You know, which agency, um, how will you distribute the data publicly? And this actually goes into a requirement that some of the agencies have as part of a grant program. And in the case of NOAA, uh, with one of their grant programs, they actually require people to come to the system, uh, inventory the data sets that they plan to produce under a federal grant, and then they review uh, the applications based on the information in the system. And you can print a report out of here to uh, support that. There are six or seven data layers in the system that require additional information. I won't say they're required fields, but they're information that everybody wants to know. And a DEM is one of the most detailed. Uh, so interval post spacing, uh, what contour interval does your data support? Do you have break lines? Uh, control monument information and that kind of thing. So little additional detail there. Um, we can save 
that record and then if we go back to the data layer search and we put in my name and I guess DEM we should uh, get a hit so it's a live system uh, we just created this record and if we go in and take a look it's going to have all of my account information associated with this uh, along with an abstract that we automatically create out of the bits and pieces of information that we just inventoried. Uh, and now you've got a federally compliant metadata record in the system. So you can see with the place keys uh, under my default geography, uh, they all show up in there, so the bounding box is here. Uh, and it really is a very simple way uh, to create that type of metadata. So I'm going to go back into my profile, and I'm actually going to delete this record right now. And uh, I can drop it out of the system like so. Um, the next thing that we're going to look at is the harvesting function, because this is a pretty big deal. Um, I'm going to add a new harvesting account. We've got, I think it's 17 records staged in the system uh, that are um, XML files, they're in the CSDGM standard, and um, they can be harvested pretty quickly. So I'm going to put the URL where we actually have those records right now, and I'm going to put uh, a name on this account for a NAPSIG uh, test account. We put a notification email in here uh, because the system once you harvest, we'll send you a notice that it started the harvest, and it will send you a notice that it's finished the harvest. But the fact is, this will happen so quickly, it uh, will be done by the time I get the email message. Uh, so I'm going to say, you know, default geography here of uh, Florida. And uh, you've got some choices. Is it a web accessible folder? Is it an FTP site or a catalog uh, web service? Uh, so I'm going to leave the web accessible folder. I'm going to put today's date in. Um, and then I'm going to say that I want to harvest manually, but you have choices to do it in an automatic fashion over time. And there are actually are several states and one or two local jurisdictions uh, that are doing this now. Uh, so it's an active account. I don't want to publish the results to the web right now. Uh, so I'm going to add this harvest account. And whoops. Okay. Um, I hope my system administrator is on the line because he's used this account. <laughs> and um, let me uh, double check that. Actually, let me look yeah. at the list of participants. Bill, uh, Boyce is on the line, and I just uh, made him available okay. to speak. All right. Hi, so Bill. Boyce is you have. You have two harvesting accounts, uh, Bill, and um, you're already harvesting that one. Oh, okay. I thought it was okay. There you go. Okay. It, it already exists. Delete this account. Okay. So I'm going to delete that account. Okay. Let me go back and do this again. I'm sorry. Bill, while we're waiting, we did have a question. Um, that uh, is not pressing, but we've got a little break here. Um, are okay. there any other national national organizations providing a similar GIS data inventory service? Well, there is the uh, data.gov platform at the federal level, uh, but they don't have a form tool, you know, entry uh, like we have. And some of the states have uh, individual systems that they've created and maintained. Uh, so, yes, there are some other tools out there, but, you know, one of the things that we provide as a service is to um, make sure that we're connecting uh, the information in our system out with those other federal systems. Uh, it's easy for them to work with one point of contact like us uh, and may be very difficult to work with, you know, 30 or 40 other jurisdictions uh, or organizations that would do this. Uh, especially when you consider the uh, level of change that happens with all these different systems over time. So I've created the harvest account, um, and at this point I'm going to go ahead and harvest, and this should just take about uh, uh, 15, 20 seconds 
to get the uh, 17 records over uh, that are in the system. I think it's 17 anyway. So I'm going to give it just a second, and then now I'm going to go in and view results. Okay. Uh, let me go back here. Always on a demo. Okay, it's showing me that it's done now. Okay. Um, Boyce, do you have any suggestions at this point? Uh, hi, Bill. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, yeah, the results uh, looks like look like they were harvested. I'm not sure why you're not seeing them there. Should I delete the account and try again? Uh, that would uh, I wouldn't be able to um, to diagnose this uh, this quickly. Okay. All right, well, this is a snag for us, um, and I have no clue why it's not working right now. Uh, it was working as of this morning. Uh, it's conceivable that it's a conflict uh, with the browser running WebEx at the same time that we're doing this. That does happen to me once in a while, uh, and I have not tried the harvesting while I've been in a WebEx uh, situation. Uh, this is something I would really like to be able to show everybody. Um, Peter, would we be able to turn the uh, session over to Boyce? Uh, sure thing. You want me to do All that right, now? Boyce, Boyce, do you have an account that you can just show how to manage the harvest results? Sure thing. Okay. All right. Yeah, Peter, Boyce, if you can turn be... it over to Boyce. Do you not have control? Okay, um, this is uh, what you should see after you um, harvest an account. You can see that there were 18 records harvested. Uh, uh, in Boyce, Boyce you, just, you have to share Boyce, your screen, Boyce. You have to share your screen oh. as well. Uh, just a second. There you go. All right, can you see it now? Oh, yeah. We can, thank you. Okay. Um, here we're viewing the uh, harvested results, and you can see the 18 records were harvested uh, under this uh, test account that I have here. Um, the harvested records are divided into the layer categories that we have, um, and uh, to manage the uh, records that were harvested, you still first uh, select the category. Um, so here there were 10 records harvested in boundaries, um, and each record uh, is listed here. Um, this, uh, there's a thesaurus which will detect the title uh, of the XML data and assign it to um, the category based on um, that title. And it has about a 90-95% accuracy. Um, if for some reason uh, a layer does not come uh, into the correct category, you can uh, change uh, that data layer by searching for um, a data layer that matches, or you can uh, manually change it by selecting a category and then selecting one of the data layers here. You can also um, preview uh, what your imported data will look like. And um, if you're happy with the changes or with the way the um, data was imported, you can choose to add it to the inventory. Um, if you're happy with all of the records, um, the way that they were imported, you can add them all to the inventory, this one checkbox here. Um, after you uh, uh, add something to the inventory or make any changes to the um, to any of the fields here, uh, including geography, um, you can see that this record here was, uh, had a uh, place key of Florida, so a geography for Florida was created for it. After you're done with all those changes, you can uh, hit Save Changes here, 
and it will automatically uh, uh, update any changes that you've made. And if you've selected to move a record into the inventory, um, you can see that it will move it into the inventory automatically for you. Um, you can uh, edit your account at any time, uh, change the, uh, the harvest uh, frequency, the date that it's harvested on, uh, whether records are published to the web or not. Uh, you can um, remove the files that you've harvested uh, at any time um, and reharvest if you want. Um, and you can always, of course, go back to this form and, and make any changes that you need to uh, to any of the data layers. Uh, does that cover everything, Bill? Uh, yeah, I think. And so should I put it back over to you, Bill? Yeah, please. Okay. You have it. Okay. So let me go back up and share again here. Okay. So I apologize about that wrinkle, but um, it happens once in a while on a demo. So the uh, next thing down in your profile uh, is the fact that we're just now starting to provide API information that will allow you to um, connect directly from your systems uh, if you want to. And this is pretty basic stuff at this point, but it's tied to your user profile uh, and the ways to get layers out of the system and to get the categories of layers and uh, that type of thing. So I just wanted you to know that if you've got programming skills, and can work with the APIs, you can try that. If you don't see functions here, we're going to add to this over time, but we want to add things that we know people want. So if you see some things that you would like to be able to do in terms of connecting to the system that would require APIs, uh, please let us know. Just open a support ticket, and um, uh, we'll go ahead and try and add those functions to the API list. Uh, another thing here Bill. is that you can send yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. We have a couple questions going back to just the previous demo um, uh, regarding your use of the term harvest. Can you help people understand who, who may not be um, as familiar with drawing data from elsewhere what you mean by harvest? Okay. Well, let me go over and open up the help guide on this, uh, which is harvesting. And it's basically a function, in this case, uh, just for registered users of the system that um, we ask the user to create a, a web accessible folder or an FTP site typically that has uh, individual files in it that has their metadata information. And there is a system called the State Clearinghouse System uh, or National Clearinghouse System that uh, contains records that are in XML format, which is a machine and human readable format and that adhere to the content standard for digital geospatial metadata, which is a very structured um, you know, system. So you create uh, individual records uh, from your system that are in those two formats and post them out into a public folder, create an account on the GIS inventory, and it allows us to come in and read that information and actually transport it over to our system. And we also make some conversions, uh, things like your data layer titles. In many cases, they might mean a whole lot to you as individuals, but other people reading your data layer titles wouldn't have a clue uh, what that data layer was all about. Um, and I could you know, go back and show you. Well, actually, uh, I think I probably have some examples here. Uh, something like marbled merlet detection sections, WS, uh, MM, data, uh, DETSECT. Uh, that's actually a bird, um, you know, a file of bird populations. So we tag it as avian distribution and habitat. A 2008 blowdown survey. If you're familiar with forestry, you know what blowdown is, uh, but we put it under forest and forest covers. So we do some conversions. Uh, on your data layers, but we keep your information intact, bring it over to the GIS inventory, and that process is referred to as harvesting. There's another part of that that's here in the instructions, and uh, based on what I saw with um, Voices screen, it's probably pretty hard to read some of this stuff unless I zoom in. But we can also come, or you can, uh, out of your ARC catalog, uh, to a web accessible folder. And in the instructions here, 
we've got a link to take you out to Esri's website, and I might as well go there, that will give you their help guide uh, online for creating standard compliant metadata uh, under you know their ARC and our catalog systems, and in how to uh, validate the metadata, and there's a section down here about exporting it. Uh, and publishing it to the standard compliant XML format. Uh, so in their system, you have to choose the CSDGM standard and XML file format. You export those files to whatever directory you want to put them into. You take them and you put them out into a web accessible folder. Uh, and we're not trying to teach you how to set up a web accessible folder. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but you might need support from your IT department to do it. Uh, because of firewalls and things like that, but you put the information out there, create an account in the GIS inventory, and then we will harvest, well, you will execute the harvest uh, in that system. So I hope that explains it. Okay, so that's uh, two other things that I want to show you. Going back to the status map, I didn't explain uh, some of these details here. So again, Status map uh, is showing here, you have the ability to turn on or off uh, the states, counties, cities uh, to show what you want to show uh, on the status map. Uh, but there's an important link here, and this is uh, a URL that you can copy and paste into your own web pages. So you can have your county fire department web page. And if you've inventoried your data, you can set up this link in your web page, and you will see this interface, uh, the status map, where people can come back and actually click on the map and come back and show your information along with every other piece of information that's in the system. So uh, that is an important function. And then the last thing that I want to show you, and that's also available on the search map, which is probably more useful. Uh, to most people, uh, it would be a different uh, URL that you would cut and paste in. And um, then there is a directory in the system. So one of the things here, um, possibly for the emergency management community, would be uh, to look at a particular zip code, and I'm going to do mine. And I'm going to say that I want to find everybody within, let's say, 25 miles of my zip code that's registered in the system, and we've got to do the CAPTCHA first, uh, time in. And then I'm going to execute that search. And so there are, uh, I guess we don't give you a head count here, but uh, that many people showing up. Uh, so this is a uh, local adjoining county uh, GIS contact, uh, state of Delaware contact. Uh, some other people, we've got, you know, this is a wide open system, so here we've got a local newspaper over in Delaware uh, that's in the system. But I can also execute the search uh, to be, you know, more focused. So people that have identified that they're in emergency management, and honestly, I'm not sure that we're going to hit anything here. Yeah, so no returns within 25 miles. Uh, I can try and open that up to 50 and see if anything happens. Okay, still not getting any, uh, but, you know, well, wait a minute. Okay, so we did get a hit uh, here on uh, the 50 miles uh, in terms of who's registered in the system that uh, selected, you know, emergency management, but may have selected four or five other things also that they're involved in. So that's, uh, I think, a relatively important function. If you're trying to locate an individual, you've run into them at a conference uh, or something like that, you might be able to find their contact information back here. Uh, by doing a search in the system form. So I'm going to stop. I know we're close to the end of our hour here, and um, if there are any last questions, I'll be glad to uh, take them. And please feel free to get a hold of me uh, at any point in time. Um, I don't think I provided my email address uh, on here, but it's William.Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S, at Comcast. Dot net, uh, and we will try and answer your questions. The only caveat I've got to that is we're going into our annual conference uh, starting this weekend for a week, uh, so I may be a little slow on uh, responses um, next week. 
coming back to you. So. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we uh, what we'll do is take there. There are a couple questions, but we can uh, I can get back to folks um, uh, directly on some of them. But the the uh, main question I think we should touch on is: Are there any plans to have widgets that would be able to access this data through a geo portal search, for example, example Flex or JavaScript? You know, we'd be glad to talk to people about what their requirements are for it. And um, uh, one of you know the things that uh, you'll find is that uh, our system developer, Boyce Tomlin, is extremely talented, but he's not a geospatial um, you know, practitioner. So in some cases, we need to actually see what it is that you want to do uh, with those types of requests. And if it makes sense for us to incorporate it, uh, we'd be glad to do it. And then a lot of times, we can create these kinds of things in an you know, hour or two. Uh, so ask you know, for whatever you want. Uh, in terms of access into the system, and we'll see what we can do. We've had widgets in the past, but they weren't very widely used. Great, thanks. Um, with that, we will turn off the recording.